I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in getting through it all, learning to depend upon the Lord. Well, it's good to have Brother Buck with us tonight. Good to see you, Brother. And he's been through the wars with the shingles and all kinds of uh, problems, but we're glad to see you, Brother, here tonight. If you could determine to go to the church, you can go to the church. Yes. Amen, Brother. Well, we're glad to see you. And uh, we're grateful for those who are watching on the Facebook Live tonight. And we had several in the parking lot this morning. By the time I get out the door, some of them had left, apparently. So some of you stayed behind told on the rest of you. <laughs> but uh, we're glad of that. Sometimes we don't, don't, sometimes we don't get out and before the service to see who's there, you know. We try to get out afterwards. Uh, but we're glad for all who are uh, listening to the services, whether you're in here or not. Well, let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to John chapter 6, please, this evening. John chapter 6. And this is the last in our series in discipleship. We did a, a, a very, very short series on Sunday mornings. And then you remember we've been doing this study for several weeks now uh, in the evening time. And really we've been looking at discipleship in the context of the local church. And really that's what you find in the New Testament. You will not find a disciple divorced for, from the local assembly. It's always discipleship in the New Testament is always in connection with the local church. And, uh, you know, in the Great Commission, 
Uh, Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's information, that's the gospel. And then when people get saved, it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And that's, I, that's identification. So they get, we get information, and then we get identification. The information is the gospel. The identification is a home, it's the church. When you're baptized, that's what it is. You're, you're joining the family. And... <clears throat> And then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And that's indoctrination. So they're taught. And so the, the Great Commission of the Church is not just getting people saved. Now we, you know, we desperately want to see people saved. But they also should be baptized and uh, brought into the church and then discipled. Where they just not are believers but also become disciples who go on for the Lord. Because it's not believers. It wasn't the believers that turned the world upside down for Jesus. It was disciples. It was people who were committed to the Lord, to follow the Lord, and to do the things, even when it was, even the hard things, when it meant following the Lord. So tonight we're going to talk about discipleship commitment. And as we've looked at the church and different aspects of the church, and then the last couple of weeks we've been looking at the individual believer and their place, our place within the body, and the gifting that God has given to us, um, and all that is, is really, it, it helps us to understand the relationship as an individual that I have in the process of discipleship with everybody else in the same process in the local church. Well, where does it start? Uh, where, do, does it, where does it really start with discipleship? Um, well, it starts with commitment. Now, I want to just briefly go back and discuss with you something we, start, we said right at the very beginning uh, keep your place there in John 6. We're going to come back there in just a minute. But look at Matthew chapter 11. Um, and we could probably quote these verses, but just go ahead and look at it. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through verse 30. And at the beginning of our study, we made the distinction between salvation and discipleship. Now, I can't overstate how important this is. When you have good, good Bible teachers like John MacArthur going off on and, and basically... Uh, stating that, you know, in order to be saved, um, you must be a disciple. Or, in order, you know, they call it lordship salvation, which means that in order to be saved, all these verses that deal with discipleship, they apply it to salvation. And when you read it, I mean, it's, 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 it's confusing because uh, the Bible teaches us that salvation is a free gift of God. But when you read the verses concerning discipleship, discipleship is not free. Jesus said it would cost you. He said you've got to sit down and count the cost. It will cost you dearly to take up your cross and follow him daily. And so when you read those two, it's two different things altogether. Because if salvation is free, then it doesn't cost you. And discipleship is not free. And when you mix those concepts together, you have, you're going to end up with problems. And really, it's like a work salvation or you lose your salvation, or you weren't really saved to begin with. And so I think there's a really clear distinction, and we see it here in these verses in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, come unto me. Now, when, we, when you read about, when Jesus invites us to come unto him, that's us coming to him. That's coming for salvation. We're coming to him to receive him as our Savior. We're coming to receive something from him. That's salvation. Salvation is not something you do for God. Salvation is not something you give to God. Well, I give to God my heart. I give to God my life. That's not salvation. Now, we use those terms. But when we come to Christ for salvation, we're not given to him anything other than our sin and our guilt and our condemnation. We're, we're handing our, our, our condemnation to him that he would take care of that condemnation, that he would cleanse us and that he would save us. And so salvation is something that is free, something that God does for us. And we get it when we come to him. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. See, people, that's the problem with religion. Uh, we, Jesus said you bind burdens upon people, but you don't even lift one finger to relieve that burden. Religion and work salvation will make you labor. It will bow you down. Uh, with works and guilt and condemnation, and there will be no rest. But he says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a given rest. This is salvation in verse 28. Now, the contrast is in verse 29, because after we come unto him, then the Bible talks about um, come after me, when we come after Christ. So we've, we've already come to him, 
And now we're coming after Christ. And that, that's, that's speaking about following Christ. That's talking about continuing after him. And so in verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, yoke is something that signifies service, burden, hardship, um, control. And he says, first of all, it's his yoke. And we're actually in the yoke with him, usually with a, like a, a yoke of mules or oxen or whatever. You have usually two animals and there's a yoke that ties them together. And they do the, the pulling. And we're in the yoke. On one side, but Jesus is on the other side. And that's why he says his yoke is, is easy and his burden is light, because he's the one doing most of the work, right? But we're, but we're in, in a connection with him, and, it's, and there's a control there. If you're in the yoke, you're not out. You know, I always picture the old horses when, they, when they're turned loose for the, uh, for the summertime, and they get out into the pasture, and you see them running out there and kicking their heels up because they're free. They know they're free. But work time's over. But when they come in from the pasture and they put the yoke on, and then they're there to work, and there's discipline there, and there's control of the master there. Now, it's not something he forces upon us. It's something we voluntarily have to receive. And so he says, take my yoke upon you. Jesus will never force his discipleship on any of us. He'll not force us to be yoked to him. But he says we voluntarily take, take his yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And that's what a disciple is. The word disciple has the word discipline in it. So the Greek word mathetes, like it's, it's about learning, like where we get mathematics from. And so he says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest. So first of all, he's given us a rest, but this is a different kind of rest. This is a found rest onto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so I think in those two verses, verse 28, you have salvation, and verse 29, you have discipleship. Salvation is free. Uh, something that God does for us. Discipleship will cost, and discipleship is something we get to do for him. So there's two uh, completely different concepts, and it's very important that we understand that. So the first question is that I've, I've asked you before is, first of all, are you a believer? Amen. Yes. It is believing that will take you to heaven. Now, is it possible to be a believer and not a disciple? Yes. Yep. Question, is it possible to be a disciple and not a believer? Yes. Have you ever heard of Judas? Yes. Judas was a disciple, but he was not a believer, and you'll see that in our passage here tonight. And, you know, that's, that's the problem with, with religion because, you know, I, in Northern Ireland, I've witnessed uh, hundreds, thousands of people, and many of them were religious people, Presbyterians. Is the Presbyterian church is the largest denomination in Northern Ireland. That's where basically Presbyterian has come from, the Scots-Irish. And I knock on the door, and we, oh, this happened hundreds of times. Lady, we lady would come out, and I'd say, Hello, I'm Tom Fittis, and I'm from Faith Baptist Church in Glen Gormley. And uh, we're here talking to people about the Lord. And uh, do you go to church? Oh, yes, son, I go to church. What church do you go to? Oh, I go to Hyde Park Presbyterian Church. And I said, Well, that's wonderful. That's great. My mom and dad were married in Bally Sill and Presbyterian Church. And, and so I'm, you know, breaking the ice type of thing. And then I would say this now I said, Now, are you a saved Presbyterian? Are you saved, Presbyterian? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. No, no. Not saved. I says, but you go to church. You're a member in the... You see, they're members because they were baptized when they were babies, you see. And so they got a whole church full of, of unsaved people that were baptized, but they were never saved. Now, here's the question. What do those people learn when they go to the Presbyterian church or the Anglican church or whatever? You know what they learn? Basically what I'm teaching. They learn biblical principles. They'll go through the Sermon on the Mount. They'll learn how to live the Christian life. They'll learn how to be a disciple and follow Christ. They'll learn of the wonderful glories of the Lord Jesus and all those wonderful things. And they're, they're trying and they're learning to become followers of Christ, and yet they haven't believed upon him. And we said there's many principles that deal with this. And, you know, one of the things about the, right in the very beginning with Cain and Abel, um, and Cain brought an offering to the Lord, and it was an offering of the fruit of the ground. And yet in the, in the, in the, in the laws of Moses, that those offerings were acceptable things. There was the barley, the wave offerings before the Lord. There was the wheat offerings, um, the meal offerings. These were things that were acceptable to the Lord. And you're thinking, well, why did the Lord refuse Cain's offering and accept Abel's offering? Abel's offering was the lamb with the blood that was shed, and why is it that he received Abel's offering and refused Cain's offering when both of those offerings were good, but they're good in their proper context? Because 
Cain's offering was a thanksgiving offering. It was a worship offering. But Abel's offering was a sin offering, the shedding of blood, the picture of the lamb. And the problem was that you must always bring the blood offering, you must always bring the sin offering first before you have the worship offering. And that's why in in popular Christianity today, uh, much is done about the praise and the worship of God. And of course, we're all for that. But what about salvation? Is it not true that many of our churches, whether it's traditional established churches or modern popular churches, are filled with people who are genuinely earnestly trying to praise and worship God, and yet they have not experienced the new birth? And that's a problem. It's always been a problem. And what we find there in Northern Ireland is they put the cart before the horse. They are dis- they're learning to become disciples, and yet they're not believers. Only being a believer will take you to heaven. Now, with discipleship, there's the privilege of service and reward when we get to heaven. But discipleship will not take you to heaven, only believing. So those distinctions, I think, are really, really important. Well, now, let's go to our our scripture tonight in John chapter 6, because I think there's an interesting principle we find here in John chapter 6, if you would turn there. And we're going to read from verse 60 through verse 69. Many, therefore, of his disciples, and I want you to notice the, in these verses the word disciple and the word believer, okay? And believe, uh, those who believe. Verse 60, many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this saying, or when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Now he's talking to disciples. But he says there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Who was that? Verse 65, and he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my father. You see, those who were taught of God in the Old Testament and had heard God when Jesus appeared, when he showed up, they received him readily and gladly. But no man can come unto me except that we're given unto him of my father. Verse 66, from that pain, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, bless and help us with your word tonight. And Lord, I know that I just don't want this to be uh, just a sermon. But Lord, may this be a challenge for all of us, not just to be content to be a believer, but Lord, that we would be so captured by your love and your so great salvation that we would, Lord, repay not, not the debt you paid, but, Lord, our devotion to you because, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. But, Lord, help us to love you and help us to know how to do that by following you and learning of you. Bless us, Lord, here tonight. May we sense your presence with us and may we hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in this passage, I want to just, and this is not a complicated message tonight, but this is about uh, the commitment to discipleship. You know, discipleship is a choice. It's just like salvation. God comes to us with uh, uh, something that he has done for us, and he wants us to respond to that. Salvation is looking to Christ, as we talked about this morning, receiving him as our Savior. And so it is with discipleship. It's a decision to take his yoke and to learn of him. Now, what we see in this passage, today, four simple thoughts. First of all, sometimes disciples face hard things. Sometimes disciples face hard things hard things. Look at verse number 60. Many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? Now I don't have time to go into everything that he said before. This is the the crowd that was following him. Um, The crowd that he uh, fed, you know, the 5,000, you know, back in verse 26, he says, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. And they were following him. And really, they would have made him king. Uh, but he realized that uh, these people were not spiritually ready for anything like that. 
And so he, he told them something that was very difficult for them to understand. Verse 48, he said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. See, you know, this, so the, he fed them bread, the fine fart barley loaves. They came the next day looking for more, more food, you know. They weren't interested really in a spirit, the spirituality or the spiritual kingdom. They were interested in what Jesus could do for them. People are like that today, you know, they'll come to the church with their hand out, you know, can the church do this, can the church do that? They wouldn't come in here and sit in the service and listen to any message, you know, they just, they're, they're here to get some money. And uh, if they only realize that the riches that they're missing, uh, you know, trying to get $20 out of us. Yeah. The same type was, was true here. Um, he says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Jesus said, I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven, and if you eat me, you will not die. Now let me ask you a question, because the Roman Catholics take this and say, well, this is the Eucharist. This is when the, the, the bread is uh, supernaturally, abracadabra, is changed into the, the actual body of Christ. And when you eat that bread, you're eating Jesus, and therefore that's your eternal life. And of course, you've got to keep doing that. And that's one of the sacraments, and sacram the salvation is through the sacraments. That's what they believe, and much of it comes out of the scripture. But let me ask you something. Did Jesus' body come down from heaven? He says, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven. Did his body come down from heaven? No. Make us right. Jesus said that when he came, he delighted to do the Father's will. He says, a body thou hast prepared me. Where was Jesus' body? When he came from heaven, he's eternally the Son of God, never had a beginning. He existed in heaven before he came. He came down from heaven, and he was conceived in the womb of Mary, the seed of the woman was never in heaven. It was always on the earth. So when he's speaking about uh, him being the bread of life, he's not speaking about eating his body. But when you eat bread, that's how you get life. That's how, you, if you don't eat, you're going to die. And if we don't have Christ, we're completely dependent upon something outside of ourselves for physical life, food and water. We are completely dependent upon something outside of our life for our eternal salvation, and that is Christ. Christ is, he is our life. We are completely dependent upon him and his work at Calvary for our acceptance with God and our eternal life in heaven with him. And so this is really what he's getting at here. But they were misunderstanding this because, again, their mind wasn't in the right place whatsoever. And so when he said these things, then many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. And the word hard there means dry and therefore rough. It's something that is um, coarse, something that is unacceptable. How can any man hear this? So Jesus said something that is a hard saying. Who can hear it? You know, sometimes that hard thing that you as a disciple might go through Maybe something actually that God says or God does. That the hard thing for these people was actually the words of Jesus. It was something that Jesus said. And it didn't make any sense to them. And we're going to see in verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back, walked no more with them. Sometimes there are things that happen in your life as a Christian that are hard. They're hard to be understood. And they're just difficult. Do you know life can, I mean, life can be so cruel and difficult. And even as a Christian, and thank God we enjoy the mercies of God every day. And many times we, we enjoy just the tokens of his love. And uh, we live, you know, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Um, his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank God for the faithfulness of God. And most of the time we're, we're living, in, you know, uh, in, in, under really good circumstances. But... Sometimes in the Christian life, it can get really tough. It could be financial reverses. It could be uh, physical and health problems that you really can't get a hold of. and can't. I mean, it, it affects you every single day. Most people don't even know about it. But you're, you're experiencing things in your body that, you know, you're not broadcasting to everybody. Although on our prayer list, you know, we got to hope things. Uh, uh, people who are sick and everything. But maybe you haven't even put that on there. But there's things that you're dealing with that are difficult that capture your mind all the time. Maybe it's relationship problems. It could be family, family problems with your children or with your parents or with your wife or husband. Um, there's all kinds of difficulties that can come into our lives. I know that as a pastor, there's always a spiritual war going on. 
And right now, I have to tell you, I mean, uh, I think the world is, there's something going on in the spiritual world, worldwide. We see it here in our country, but it's not just here. It's in Europe, it's in Great Britain, it's in Australia, it's in Africa, it's all over the place. And a lot of times when, you, when there's that spiritual war for God, something's going to happen. And it doesn't look well. And also in the church, the whole COVID thing has been a weapon used by Satan to hurt the church. There's no doubt about that. There's people who are home tonight and they feel like they need to be home and, and they have every reason to be home. Um, but they're not here. And I've said that whatever the, the reason we're not here, when we're not here, then there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's something missing in our fellowship and the chemistry of the local church that is missing. If I'm gone for, from church for like for one Sunday, it's going to affect me. But if I'm gone for a long period of time and the people here at home and they're listening to the messages and thank God they have this lifeline, but uh, they will tell you probably more than I would that it certainly has affected them. And I think it's affected our church. But not only that, you know, we're in a building program, you know, a big building program and a little building program. We're coming to the end of the little building program. And that's been, I said to Leslie today that every time I've been in a building program, there's always been a spiritual warfare. That's right. Something about it. If the church is trying to advance in some way, Satan wants to oppose it. Right. Now, how does that happen? It happens all different kinds of ways. You know, sometimes I'll come in here and there's just, a, there's just an atmosphere. Now, it's, it's not you. There's a spiritual warfare going on, and I'm sitting there, and I'm wrestling. Now, you maybe not even know it. I'm absolutely wrestling in my spirit with things. And there is a warfare that is going on, and it's difficult. And so in your life as well, in the life of the church, and the life of the pastor, there are hard things that we face as disciples. And Jesus told us it would be like that. He says, in the world you shall have tribulation. We're not home yet. We're in foreign territory. We're, we're ambassadors in, in a foreign land. And we can't expect to be treated the way we're going to be when we get home. Jesus said, if they love me, they'll love you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. And of course, we know the answer to all those things. But especially when we sometimes, in those difficulties, and we just can't see the face of God, or we can't feel the touch of God, or we somehow don't hear his voice anymore see that's the most difficult part of it that was job's problem he was going through all those all those dreadful losses the loss of his family the loss of his wealth the loss of his health and he couldn't find god in the thing and god was absent until the end of the story when god revealed himself and that was the real test of job's faith and so you and i and Disciples worldwide will face hard things, and especially when, like here, it is something that Jesus said, it's something that God does, that, or something that God allows, and we don't understand it, and it, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard, because we don't have an answer. In John 13, verse 7, as Jesus is about to wash the disciples' feet, he comes to Peter. Here's what he says. What I, what I do now, thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Did you know that God reserves the right to do things in your life that he will not explain himself? That's right. He says, what I do now, thou knowest not. But the promise is that one day you will know. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, then shall I know as also as I am known. All the secret things will be revealed. That's going to be an awesome time. But what do you do now? What do you do when you can't see the face of God? You can't feel his presence? When you're going through as a disciple these hard things, even through things that maybe God has allowed, and you don't understand it, it's like the opposite of what you think God would be like. What do you do? Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Don't lean to your own understanding. Our understanding is so imperfect. We have no idea how imperfect it is. So trust him. Trust God in the dark. So sometimes disciples face hard things. And if you're going through hard things as a disciple, hey, understand that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren in the world, First Peter says. And there's other believers going through exactly what you're going through. They're feeling exactly. You know, other churches are going through exactly what we're going through. And many of them are going through worse that we're going through. And pastors have the same feelings that I feel at the time. And, and you, as other believers, has the same feelings that you have. And the same issues in your family, other families have. 
And uh, it's common. Those things are common to man. And it's good that you understand that. That it's, it's normal to go through this life and to, have, to go through hardships, hard things. Okay? Second thing is that sometimes disciples stop following. Now, this is very sad. Look at verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured. You see there, we talked about that this morning, didn't we, with uh, Moses and the, the, the fiery serpents that came because they murmured against God and they murmured against Moses. So they murmured. His own disciples murmuring. And he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Now the word offender is the Greek word scandalizo, where we get the word scandal from. And it means to stumble. It means to trip up, to scandalize, to offense, to offend. It's a stumbling block. Is this a stumbling stone for you? And of course it was. And there's always, there will always be things that will try to stop you from following the Lord, always. Did you know that Satan has traps out everywhere? The book of Proverbs talks about that. He, you know, the wicked lay traps for the righteous. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, Satan, our enemy, has traps laid all over the place for us. There's traps laid in the church. Something will be said, or this member will fall out with that one, or misunderstand this member, and, and he wants to bring division in the body and sow discord among the brethren, and, and uh, there's traps led for us. We've got to open our eyes and understand. There's, we've got to be careful because one thing leads to another, and there are traps led for us by our enemy. And there's always things in the Christian life, especially for disciples, where Satan wants to stop you from following you see, it is possible for disciples to stop following. It happened right here. Look down at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And so it did become a scandalizo. It did become a stumbling block eh, where they're tripped up over this. Because, you know, Satan has at least two plans for your life. Plan A is he wants your soul. He wants to take you to hell. And so, you know, when I'm preaching the gospel, as we did this morning, and there's one or two or three or four people in here, and I don't know who was watching or whatever, listening, but if they're not saved, then I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for their soul. I'm, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times when I'm getting ready to preach, it's like somebody getting, the, getting their boxing gloves on, because I'm, I'm standing in the ring, and I'm, I'm duking it out. I'm fighting tooth and nail with Satan, and we're trying to reach their souls, but Satan's sitting in their seat and whispering in their heart and ears, trying to keep them. He has a plan for their lives. He wants to take them to hell forever. That's plan A. He wants their soul, wants your soul. Now, when you get saved, then he has to mark out one of plan A is destroyed because he'll never get, he'll never get your soul. But he doesn't stop there. Plan B he wants your life. Satan wants your life. If you're saved this morning, he wants your life. He wants you to be ineffective in your service and in your relationship with the Lord. He wants your life to be completely tripped up and stumbled at and stopped. He wants you as a disciple to stop following the Lord. And so many of them did. Many of them, many of his disciples went back, walked no more with him. I think that's, a very, that's one of the saddest things in the Bible. But, you know, it's just one of the saddest things for me as a pastor. I said to somebody this week, I said, you know, if, if I had, even in this church, we've been here, what, nine years now? If I had been able to keep everybody that's come through the doors of this church, you'd need another term of 400 people. Honestly, you would. Yes. And it's one of the hardest things in my ministry because, I mean, we, we had a, and who knows what people are looking for, but people come to the church and, I mean, I, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had a fellow call me, he, he says, um, I won't give you the details, but it had to do with my name and his name. And he says, well, I want, he says, I want to ask you about, do you believe in eternal security? I said, yes. He says, well, good. So he came. I thought, well, this, this is great. He came with his wife, two of the grandkids. This is several months, maybe over a year ago. And I thought, well, he was very interested, you know. And I, I preached a really, I, well, you know, I thought I preached a really good sermon. You know, maybe it was just rubbish. It was just my opinion. But I thought I preached a really good message. And actually we showed, it was when, I'll tell you when it was, we showed the, the video of the new church, right? The new church. Well, I mean, that's, that's our A game. I and mean, we're showing them what, what we're hoping to do. And that was very, I was encouraged by watching the video. I thought I preached a good message. Never came back. Never called again. And... 
And I'm, I'm, you know, I thought we had a connection there. I mean, what did I do wrong? What did I say wrong? And pastors and preachers, they, I mean, if something goes wrong, I always look here first, and, I, and it's right to do that. But it's just, it's frustrating when people turn back and they don't, you know, they, they leave church and you never see them again. And it rips the heart out because let me tell you something, when you become a member in the church and you're here for a long period of time, even a short period of time, and you're there and your wife's there and your children are there, and our hearts uh, are intertwined with you. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be because if you come to our church and we're, we're still like, you know, uh, a year down the road and it's like, you know, we don't even know you or you don't even know us and there's no affection between us, then there's something wrong with that church, you know. And so naturally we have to be vulnerable and we want to love you. And then when something happens in the blue light and we don't see anymore, a little piece of us goes with you. It rips the heart out of us. And so that's one of the hardest things of ministry. But it happened here. And they went no more, walked no more with Jesus. Now I think this is, has to be something they regret it. I think these people have regretted this move. Now, you say, well, did they regret it during their lifetime? It might not have been during their lifetime. But I think when you know as much as they knew and heard what they heard from Jesus and then they walked away from it, and maybe some of them weren't saved because there are disciples who are not saved, like Judas. He wouldn't have been the only one. But I think even if they were saved, they had to regret this. Look, look over at Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Because... You know, they didn't want to follow him now when just because they didn't maybe understand something that he said. And yet there's going to come a time when Jesus will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords and all of creation will bring glory to him. All, every knee shall bow. And can you not imagine with me that those people who, who, were, who knew the Lord and who had been taught by the Lord and then they walked away from the Lord, do you think that's going to bring some Tremendous regret to their hearts, if not here, there. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 21, it says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And by the way, to me, that's so very important. It's good that we're good, but the greatest ability is availability. The greatest thing in our lives is faithfulness. You may think, well, I really don't do anything at church. I might do a little here, a little there. But all I'm there is basically a seat warmer. Never think that. Because I'm telling you, you are so very, very important in being faithful yes. to God's house and to the ministry of the church here. Um, it's so very, very important to be faithful. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Then he says this, thou hast been faithful. It doesn't say thou hast been good or thou hast been successful. He says thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Do we really understand that what we do in this life as a disciple has a great bearing on reward later on in the next life? Some Christians have no concept of that. As long as I'm saved, as long as I get in. It may not mean anything to you now, but when you're standing there, it's going to mean everything to you. And there will be regret. I think these people will have regretted what they did in walking away from the Lord. And another thing that I think is important here. In verse 66, uh, between verse 66, look, look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back, walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? You know, there's no record in verse 66 and verse 67 of Jesus said, thinking, oh, wait a minute. No, don't, oh, don't leave. Don't be walking away. Oh, wait a second. No, no, I didn't mean it that way. Let me, let me explain to you what I really meant. You know, Jesus never tried to stop them from leaving. That's right. As a pastor, as a young pastor, and some of you may think to yourself, well, you know, Tom doesn't really run after people who leave the church. It wasn't always like that. When we started our churches, um, well, also in Belfast and also primarily in Antrim, and that was a baptism of fire when we started. It was the first church we started, and that's a long, long story. But um, we had people leave, and I went after them. I visited with them in their home. I played with them and begged with them not to go, not to, not to, not to ruin their Christian testimony and not to hurt the church. And, and you know what? And, and, and I literally went bent over backwards to try to help people not to do the wrong thing. And you know what? It was like water off a duck's back didn't work anyway. And I really felt kind of violated by it. You know, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, lest they turn on you and rend you. 
And it's, I think it's interesting, to me it's interesting that Jesus did not try to stop these people. Because they knew enough. If you're coming to this church any length of time at all, you know what, you know what the issues are. And you decide to leave and go and go somewhere else. You know, what good is it for me to go after you and to plead and beg for you to, to come back? And it won't work anyway. And so he let them go. Sometimes disciples stop following. You see, you cannot fail in salvation because that's something he does. But you really can't fail in discipleship because that's something that you do. Number three, disciples must be prepared for a challenge. Look at verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. So he just watches all these. I mean, what, there was thousands. There was at least 5,000 men. And they basically walked away. And from the, uh, in verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve. So now he, so they're all gone and they turns to the twelve. That's kind of pitiful, really. But he said this, will you also go away? Will you also go away? You see, it is possible to go away. It is possible to stop being a disciple. Now, to begin following the Lord, as we said a moment ago, is a choice. I want you to look over at Luke chapter 9. Um, and what I'm saying is disciples must be prepared for a challenge. You know, really this was a, a, a challenge from Jesus. Will you also go away? I mean, that was probably a shocker for them. But it was, I think it was a genuine question. And it was a challenge. So all these other people are leaving. Are you going to leave? All these other people have stopped uh, walking with me and following. Are you going to do the same thing? Will, will you also leave? Will you also go away? And so the challenge is this. When you begin to follow the Lord, when you, and we're, going to, we're looking at this discipleship commitment tonight, and everybody, just like we decide to be saved, we should also decide to follow that should be a decision that we make. Just as real as our salvation decision is a decision to follow the Lord. I was only saved, I don't know, just a few weeks. I think it was two months when I actually came down front and said, I'm giving my life to the Lord. And the preacher said, well, what does that mean? I says, I'm going to go to Bible school. I heard about Tennessee Temple. He says, well, when do you want to go? I says, well, when does it start? He says, it starts in two months. I says, well, that's when I'm going. So that's like taking your whole life and just turning it over, right? So I was going to stop my work, stop my apprenticeship, leave home, leave family, leave friends, leave everything I knew to go to a place I'd never been to before. My aunt says to me, what happens if you go over there and you don't like it? And I said, I never even thought about that because it was something I felt constrained to do. So when we decide to follow the Lord, that's a choice. But guess what? It's not just one choice. It's a choice every single day. Because in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, look what it says here. In verse 23, and he said unto them all, if any man will come after me. And notice that it didn't say come to me. He said come after me. That's not salvation. That's discipleship. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Did you know you have the opportunity every day to stop being a disciple? Really all of us face that challenge Every day, be prepared to face that challenge. Every day will we follow the Lord. Now, what does that mean? It means we have to keep our eyes on him. It's like, you know, Peter looking at the waves instead of looking at the Lord. As soon as, when he was looking at the Lord, he was fine. He was walking on the water. But as soon as he took his eyes off the Lord to look at the waves and the wind, then he began to sink. And especially when those hard times come to your life and my life, and we get discouraged. Am I the only one that gets discouraged as a Christian or you get discouraged too? So when we get discouraged and sometimes that happens really because we take our eyes off the Lord and maybe we'll have a challenge, well, are we going to follow the Lord today? Well, how did you get saved? Like I said this morning, by looking unto Jesus, right? There's life in a loop. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so we're saved by looking in faith. And so he says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So how do you live the Christian life the same way you get into it? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. We get saved by looking to Jesus and we live every day by still looking to Jesus. He's the author, that's the beginner and the finisher of our faith. So he's at the beginning and he's at the end and he's everywhere in between. We need the Lord 
every single day. And so it's important that we are prepared for that challenge. Will you also go away? Let me ask you, are you a disciple? The first question is, are you a believer? But the second question is, are you a disciple? Or would you walk away? Would you stop being a disciple? Because it is possible. And disciples must be prepared for that challenge every single day. Jesus said to Peter, will you also go away? Actually, he said to all of them. The 12, will you also go away? But it's Peter that stood up. And this is my last point. Disciples should be willing to make a commitment to follow. Look at verse 68. And this is lovely, isn't it? <clears throat> and by the way, here's a guy who actually did deny the Lord and who did the go away. He says, I go a fishing. And uh, the Lord came looking for him for sure. But in verse 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Isn't this great? He says, are you also going to go in? And Peter says, Lord, who are we going to go to? <laughs> you know, when you've experienced the best, where are you going to go? Amen. He says, you have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go? Disciples should be willing to make a commitment to follow the Lord and really be willing to make that every day. But it's, it's not because we feel like it or because it's easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. There's many times as a disciple, it is extremely hard to do the right thing. It's extremely hard to make those right choices. It's extremely hard to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And that commitment must be based on our confidence in him, his person, and his promises. That's exactly what he's saying here. He says, you have the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. This is not just an emotional thing. This is, this is because it's based on conviction. It's based on fact. It's based upon who we know you are. We believe in him. We're sure. There is nobody else. There is nowhere else to go. It's a very sad thing. To be a disciple and to stop following. You think your life's going to get any better? No, it's not. You know, people are afraid of this message tonight. So, and to be honest with you, I, I put this thing together. I'm going to show you that in a second. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to put it out there. I'm almost, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm almost afraid to call for you to, to, to challenge you to a commitment to discipleship. Because many people are afraid of it. But what's better than God's will for your life and his way for your life? You got, you got a better plan? The person who made you and created you and his plan for your life? Thy good and faithful servant. If you do the things that are pleasing in his sight and you're faithful in what little you have to offer, you're faithful and faithful and faithful. I'm going to tell you, you're going to meet Jesus one day and you'll be so glad that you followed him and learned of him. And so that commitment is based on our conviction about who he is and what he's promised, what he's promised. And so as we close tonight, where do we start? Now this is going to all be in this little booklet that we're putting together. And we started out with that little target there. You remember that little target? And uh, Brother Billy thought I was making targets for target practice. But that's not what that is. And that's an interesting little diagram, isn't it? Because it's, these are concentric circles that come in, and you have the outer community, right? So the people outside these, these walls, and sometimes you may have the odd personal come in here, right? And they're here for one service, you never see them again. That's the community. Then you have the crowd, that's like the regular attenders, the people who would come here on a regular basis. But people who come here on a regular basis are not all members, you, you know that, right? So that's the, the crowd. But then the congregation, the actual congregation, you see the red line? The red line means, if you're inside the red line, it means you're in church membership. If you're on the outside of the red line, it means you're outside of church membership. Now you say, and we talked about this. Is there such a thing as church membership? Yes, there is. In Acts chapter 1, they were numbered with the disciples. And in the upper room, there was 120 that were numbered together. What is the number? It's a, it's a roll. There was, a, there was names on There was 120 names on that. And when the 3,000 people got saved, they were joined to those names. They were added to the church. And then also in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, um, what have I to judge those that are, uh, 
within. He says, that's your job as a church. You judge those that are within. Within what? Within the church membership. He says, put that man who was sinning seriously, publicly, put that man out of your fellowship. We call that excommunication um, or church discipline. He's put outside the church. Well, if there's no line, if there is in and out, if there's no in and out, if there's no membership, then you can't have an in and out. We're all in the same boat. We're not all in the same boat. I believe that the New Testament teaches that every believer should be a member in a local church and placed in that local body with a particular gift to serve the Lord and to contribute and to build up in that local assembly. And so I think membership is important. I think the Bible teaches it. But then not all members in the congregation are true disciples. Isn't that true? Now, if we're really following the Lord and the concepts of the in the precepts of the New Testament, all of us should be maturing disciples. Because you cannot divorce really discipleship from the local church. When you're in the local church, you should be maturing and growing. And there must be a commitment. And you see in that center, you've got core membership in the church. And all churches are like this. You have a core membership who are really, really committed to the Lord and to its work. And then you have concentric circles of people who are less and less committed all the way to the outside. And uh, I've said this often, you don't often laugh at it, but it's still true that the church is like a football game. Did you see Titans game today? I never watched football, but the Titans won today. You know, yeah, amazing, isn't it? Anyway, and somebody told me the Atlanta, I went out to a, a truck there this morning and a visitor was there. He says, what about the Atlanta Braves? I says, but what's that all about? Apparently they're going to the World Series or something. I have no idea, no idea whatsoever. But anyway, what was I saying there? <clears throat> I forget. <laughs> What was it saying? It's a game. The football game. The church is like a football game. You've got 22 people who need rest, and they're doing all the work. And you've got 22,000 people who need exercise, and they're watching. Just like the church. It's always the same people. Doing all. I've said to somebody this week, I said, if you want to get something done, ask somebody who's already doing something. Right. Ask a busy person if you want to get it done, because they know how to get it done. Don't ask a person not doing anything, because they'll never get done. Anyway. The church community, we see this here. Now, what we're looking for is the church's responsibility is to take people in the outer concentric circles and bring them into the center. That's the ministry of the church. We're trying to get people out there and bring them in here, right? And not just the Sunday morning crowd, but also, I mean, just the, you know, the, you know, the large congregations usually on Sunday morning. So we're trying to get those on Sunday morning to be here on Sunday night and on Wednesday night. And it's always smaller for some reason, you see. But we're trying to get them into being committed disciples of the Lord. So how does that happen? It starts with commitment. Now, <clears throat> I put this little, it's like a little certificate, right? That's to impress you that this is important. And really those, those four points are things we covered in a previous lesson. My commitment to God and church membership. I promise to protect the uni unity of my church by acting in love toward other members, refusing to gossip, follow the leaders. Number two, I promise to share the responsibilities of my church by praying for my church, inviting all church to attend, welcoming those who, who visit. We're loving. Somebody said that we had two visitors to the, the senior outing, and they said when they were parting, they said, your church loves, you're so close, they said. They said, we're very envious of that. You seem to really care about one another, right? Amen. That's a good compliment, isn't it? Yes. And so, and uh, we welcome those who visit. We're loving church number three. I promise to serve the minister of my church by discovering my gifts and talents. We've been talked about that. Being equipped to serve by my pastor. And basically trying to equip you, Ephesians chapter four. Developing a servant's heart. So we want to serve. We're not just here to sit, we're here to, we're here to serve. Number four, I promise to support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully. And I want to say this, if somebody is not faithful in our church, and sometimes it slips by or sometimes they are faithful and then they become unfaithful, and they have a position. If you have a position, we expect you to be faithful because you're an example. Right. And uh, there was a time here when we had people teaching children's church, and that's the only time they were here. They taught children's church, weren't here... Uh, Sunday night, we're here Wednesday night. And of course, they're not here at all now. See, that's not right. And it's my job to try to sort that out, which I don't like doing. But faithfulness is so very important. And really, the leaders should be looking for those who are faithful. And we ask the faithful ones to do the work. It's so very important. 
So attending faithfully, living a godly life. If you are a member of, of Calvary Baptist Church, we, we expect you to lean, live a clean life. If you're living in adultery, we're coming after you. We're gonna, if we find that out, we're coming to you. We're going to ask you to repent. We're going to try it, and we're going to love you and try to get you right with God. Because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting Christ and you're hurting Christ's testimony and the testimony of his church. And we're going to go after you. We're going to try to help you to get right. And if you refuse to get right, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose your membership. That's part of our covenant to live a godly life and to give regularly. And so, and, and these are just, you know, this is just a sampling really of what a commitment is. And you should know what that is. And it's in the church covenant as well. And we have a place for you to sign and date. Now, we're not expecting you to sign and date that and hand them over. Okay, hand them in, sign it and hand it in. Okay, we're not doing that, okay. <laughs> and uh, I even thought maybe those who are committed, maybe to stand up at the end of the service and, and come down here in commitment. But you know, what I, you know what I've experienced? I've experienced where people will come down here and they'll say, yes, I'm committed. And you never see them next week. I've seen that happen. Do you know what I'm concerned about? That in your heart, that you'll take the truth of what I've said tonight and you'll think about it and say, you know what, Lord? I'm challenged every day to be a disciple, to be committed as a Christian, because that's what God wants of me. That's what God expects of me. That's what God deserves from me. God gave me his very best. And in discipleship, it should be really nothing for me to give him my very best. And so I would be happy if you just took the message tonight and it meant something to you, and maybe changed your own heart or, or solidified and, and fortified your own position and your own commitment to Jesus, whether you said publicly or not, you know it's true in your heart if you're committed, because that's where it starts. Where do I start? Well, being a, a committed disciple. Maybe you've never made that decision to give your life to the Lord, to follow him. That's something that you should do, just like you got saved. And it's not just a once for all. I mean, you do make that decision, but it's every day. You take up your cross daily and follow him. Father, we pray that you'll help us tonight as we close this service, that these truths, and Lord, I pray that people will, will hear the truth of your word and the concepts that are so important. And Lord, all of us feel in many ways, but Lord, our heart's desire and prayer to you is that we would indeed follow you with our whole heart and help us, Lord, to hear those words one day, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So Lord, hear and help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.